Well, next up we have Lin Dr. Linda Seiler, Reverend Linda Seiler, PhD, I should say. I'm trying to get that right, Linda. Um, but um, Linda is going to share her keynote, Once Gay, Always Gay, question mark, findings from 30 case studies. Dr. Seiler, uh, or Reverend Seiler, is an ordained Assemblies of God minister and currently serves as the National Chi Alpha Missionary, which is their college group. endorsed by the Assemblies of God, which equips the church to address LGBTQ. For decades, Linda felt like the, um, a, a man trapped in a female body and was exclusively attracted to women. Today, she is content in a female body and wholly attracted to men. Dr. Seiler offers a unique, compassionate perspective as one who struggled with her own gender identity and her sexuality. Linda obtained her Bachelor of Art degree at University of Illinois, a Master of Arts at Christian Ministries at Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, where she also obtained her PhD in Intercultural Studies. Linda is an avid golfer, a dark chocolate lover, a cat mom to feline Facebook sensations, Bo and Tabby, and truly, they are feline sensations. Immediately following her keynote, there will be a question and answer time with Linda, which I will moderate. I'll take your questions and she and I will work through those as best we can. As you know, you can type questions in where the question mark box is over on the right side of your screen. Um, you can also go into that area and vote up or click on the numbers to increase the number of people who want to know about the answer to that particular question that they see in there. And that will actually raise the question in in the list. So we'll start with the most uh, the, the questions people most want to hear first, and then work our way down. So that's how that will work. Uh, Linda, welcome to the stage. Thank and, you, Anna. Um, take it away. I'm going to move out of the way. Okay. It's great to be with you all, and. I ask the presenter to stop sharing. Oops. Okay. I'm going to share my slides. Show. A slide is actively being shared. Ask the presenter to stop sharing. Aren't I the presenter? You are. If I have the old slides here, I will need to get rid of them. Um, it appears that they are now gone. So try again. Hey, there we go. Okay, we're ready to go. Yeah, so I'm uh, Linda, if I haven't met you. And um, what I'm going to share today are the findings from my dissertation research, which I graduated from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in 2020. I have a fun picture of my sister who makes life fun. That's Nancy jumping up in the air. And um, my degree from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary is in intercultural studies, which initially I thought was like training me to be a missionary to China or something. But what intercultural studies is the study in three different areas. If you imagine a Venn diagram with theology, the study of God's word, sociology, the study of culture, and then missiology, our mission to the world. And how do those truths from those three areas intersect? So, for example, what do we learn from theology, the study of God's word about the topic specifically of homosexuality? What does God's word say? And then what is the world saying, um, our culture, and also different aspects of the world that we can study, like sociology, culture, uh, psychology, biology, anthropology, all the ologies. And then um, how does what God's word says say and what culture says um, inform our pastoral care and our mission to the lost? And so my I have a number of chapters in my dissertation on the theology. And Dr. Gagnon did an amazing job earlier today talking about how to address homosexuality from a scriptural point of view. And then I have other chapters on uh, what does science say? Are people born gay? Are they born trans? And so forth. 
And then I moved into my field research, which was 30 case studies of men and women who were formerly same-sex attracted and have experienced transformation and applying what do we learn, you know, theologically and sociologically to these this actual field data and how that informs our pastoral care and mission to the lost. So um, I'll be going through those findings. I do have a book that's coming out later this year, and I'll I I have chapters that are summarizing each of those areas of study, and then uh, landing on uh, starting with the the theology of biblical theology of sexuality and looking at the science and how do these desires develop? How does transformation happen pastorally? How do we walk somebody through that practically speaking? What about spiritual warfare and principalities and powers and prayer? How do we navigate those conversations with LGBTQ identified loved ones? And what do we do practically about cultural conundrums like gay, do I attend a gay wedding? What about transgender pronouns and all of that? So that'll be available later this year. And I'm, we'll be sharing that with Anne and the Restored Hope Network. So you're aware when the book comes out. But um, what I want to talk about today is just specifically the field research aspect of my dissertation. And I'd like to pray just before we launch into this. So Father, I thank you for um, just the privilege of being able to do this research and just the um, the it was like a sea of revelation that I was in as I was doing this, Lord. And uh, I thank you for the things that you revealed during that time. And I pray that the truths you want shared today would be what comes out of my mouth. Uh, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart just track with you, Holy Spirit. You know the unique group of people on this call and who will be watching. And so I just pray you would cater your message, your word to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, where we're at today in our culture, obviously, is that our culture is saying that same-sex attractions are inborn and immutable. That You're born that way. You absolutely cannot change. And that if you even attempt to change, that is psychologically harmful to somebody. So that's the claim that's made. And, and we've arrived at now the idea that if it's inborn and immutable, it must be the same as, for example, eye color or skin color. And so it would be cruel to take somebody who has, you know, is born with white skin and say they can change and be black or vice versa. You, you can't change aspects of your DNA. And we even have Supreme Court rulings now that are saying gender identity and sexual orientation is included in identity. And of course, that's why we have all of the chaos we have in our culture now. And so the idea is that's this inborn genetic uh, thing in you that can't change. So it should become a civil right. Um, now we have things that we're dealing with that people are calling conversion therapy bans where they would qualify Restored Hope Network as people who practice conversion therapy. That's a pejorative term that LGBTQ activists have come up with to malign people who believe in transformation because the narrative is you're born gay, can't change. And if you're born gay and can't change, then naturally it should be a civil right, not a moral issue. So if if I'm you know born as a woman, um, even that's controversial today, what is a woman? But um, you can't discriminate against me because I'm a woman that's beyond my control to, to beyond anything I can control. So there's laws, at least there used to be on the books to protect against that. Well, now they're saying it's, it's cruel to say somebody's sexual orientation could change and you religious people uh, and therapists are trying to convert or, or force somebody to change and be something that they can't be. That's cruel. Um, and so they use the terms conversion and therapy to hit both the religious workers, because conversion is a religious term, and then therapy, a, a medical term, a therapeutic term that hits counselors and licensed therapists. And so you smush those together and it's like we anybody that talks about transformation, whether you're coming at it from a clinical point of view or a religious point of view, pro-gay activists want to silence you and cancel you. And that's the culture where we're in now. So. The idea is that you're born gay, but when you look at the data and the actual science that's out there, there have been these theories from way back in the 80s and 90s that uh, maybe there's a gay gene, or maybe there's a structure in your brain that will make you gay, or maybe you've been exposed to certain hormones that affect your sexuality. And these are being thrown out there 
and people are repeating the lie born gay can't change so often that the younger generations, they literally believe that. When I go to university campuses and I ask students, are people born gay? Are people born trans? And they, they, they don't even doubt it. Oh, absolutely, they're born that way. And so they can't change. So we have to make laws to protect it as a civil right and so forth. But when you look at the actual data that's out there and the science that's out there, let's take, for example, genetically, is there a gay gene? They have been searching for decades to find a gay gene. And the strongest evidence for that would be identical twin studies, because we know identical twins have identical DNA. So if one twin is gay, then, and it's, it's genetic, then, uh, you know, a significant amount of time, the other twin should also be gay if it's entirely genetic. But what they find is in identical twin studies, less than nine, about 9.8% of the time when one male is gay, then the other male is also gay. It's a, it's a very small percentage. And so the researchers themselves are admitting, you know what, there might be something in the environment that's contributing to this because there's, there's not a strong genetic component. And in fact, as technology continues to advance, what we find now are these things called genome-wide association studies. Uh, the largest study I'm aware of back in 2019 used a pool of nearly a half million people from the 23andMe database, you know, those uh, companies where you turn in your saliva and they check your ancestry. And in this database of nearly a half million people where they're looking at sets of genomes that are literally millions of genes at once that they're looking at to see, is there any connection between those who have a specific gene pattern and those who identify as LGBTQ? and what they, they can't find anything of statistical significance. And so the experts, they're trying to twist and manipulate the data and say, you know, to, to try to push the narrative of born gay can't change, but the data isn't there to indicate that. And so the other theory I mentioned, second one was the idea of uh, maybe there's a brain structure, a structure in your brain that makes you gay from birth, uh, that comes all the way back from 1991. Simon LeBay said, oh, the hypothalamus in the brain of gay men is smaller than that of straight men. So it's a little bit more like a woman in gay men. And so he that was trumpeted on the cover of Newsweek and or Time, one of those magazines. And um, everybody's thinking, oh, yeah, we we're going to know from birth whether or not what somebody's you know sexual orientation is. And yet that was study was never replicated. And in fact, here we are decades later and we now there's something called neuroplasticity where your brain is essentially plastic in response to the environment around you. I spent years wanting to be a man, thinking like a man, aspiring, you know, masculine kinds of things. And so my brain was adapting to that. But as God began to heal me uh, and, and I created new neural pathways, then I, I'm, not, I'm less likely to go down the old pathways and more likely to go down the new as they're reinforced. And so there's not a structure in your brain that would determine from birth, this is what's going to determine your sexual drives and desires, though we do know the brain and sexuality are inextricably linked. Uh, we know, for example, if somebody's addicted to pornography and we do an fMRI of their brain, we can actually see the neural pathways of that addiction. But if we they go 90 days without acting on that and create some new neural pathways, the fMRI will actually look different. And so this is just, we know the brain changes in response to our environment. Um, the third uh, theory is that maybe there's just hormonal exposure. Linda, you were exposed to too many androgens in the womb and it masculinized your brain but it didn't virilize your body. So you ended up with a female body, but a, a masculine type brain. Um, any endocrinologist worth their salt will tell you that the official term for that is hoo-ha. <laughs> it's not true because hormones do not work indiscriminately. They, they work uniformly throughout the body. They don't say, oh, this is the brain. Let's attack the brain, but oh, reproductive organ, let's stay away from that. That's not how hormones work. And what we do know, for example, is the hormonal environment for twins, identical twins, they share the exact same hormonal environment. And yet, how do you explain that one twin might develop attractions to the same sex or gender insecurity and one twin does not? Uh, and in my case, God has totally transformed me. 
And it wasn't because I had estrogen injections or something to counteract androgens in my body. Uh, it was God ministering to the soul, my mind, will, and emotions, and renewing my mind to align with the physical body that my creator has given me. So those are some of the you know things regarding are people born gay? There is not at this point scientific evidence that, that shows this is something that's hardwired into your DNA uh, or genetics or your brain structure or even hormonal influences. Although you wouldn't know that because Newsweek didn't retract when none of this was replicated. The news outlets didn't trumpet you know, the truth. Uh, that's not what you're going to hear. All you're going to hear is the cultural narrative, born that way can't change. Uh, so what we do know from the research is there is evidence that there are developmental influences that can impact the way that we think. And we know as believers, we are spirit, soul, and body. And so what impacts your mind and what you think on, which is why it's so important to take thoughts captive and renew the mind, what goes on in your mind will eventually impact your decisions. It will impact your, your, your mind, impacts your will uh, and your emotions, what you feel, and that eventually impacts what you do. And that holds true to any area of life, including our sexuality. And so we do see some developmental influences that can impact what's called our psychosexual development. I'll give you three examples um, that came up in my research. Uh, gender nonconformity, adverse family dynamics, and childhood sexual abuse. So, for example, gender nonconformity is when a child doesn't fit the cultural stereotype of what we think masculinity is or femininity is. I was a gender nonconforming child. I had typically masculine interests. I wanted to play sports. I, I wanted to be outside playing kickball with the boys. I didn't want to be inside playing Barbies or pretending to put up ma on makeup like my older sister, Nancy. I just gravitated towards those masculine kinds of things. And I was made fun of at school. And that's psychologically traumatic for a little kid not to fit in and to be made fun of by the other kids. Likewise, if a little boy is, is uh, not athletic and maybe he's in touch with his emotions and he's artistic and he's verbal and so forth. Um, he can be made fun of at school and be called a sissy and all sorts of derogatory names. And that psychological trauma remains in the soul, even as they mature into adulthood. And that can remain with them and cause them to question, is there something deficient about my masculinity or about my femininity? And that can affect our psychosexual development. Adverse family dynamics can play into it. Every child needs a mommy that represents the world of woman to them and a daddy that represents the world of men to them. And a child based on their experience with mom or dad will make judgments about what men are like or about what women are like based on what they see in the home. So if dad beats up on mom, it's apparently men are not safe and I'm not sure that I wanna be a woman and get beaten up on by men. Or if mom is absent and, and not there, whether emotionally absent um, or uh, a workaholic and just doesn't connect with the daughter, and then that can leave a, a vacuum in her heart for feminine love that didn't get met the way God designed her. Or, or if the mother dies or there's you know extreme experiences in the home, it can affect the psychosexual development of that child and the need that they need of same-sex love and opposite-sex love. And that can tie into the development potentially of same-sex attractions. Um, another one is childhood sexual abuse. If that same little boy, for example, that's artistic and sensitive and not fitting in at school and being made fun of, pedophiles know how to find the one that's ostracized and groom their prey, so to speak, and he'll give that little boy some attention, some male attention that he's just so thirsty for, albeit inappropriate attention. And then as the little boy goes, why did he choose me and not the athlete? Why did my body respond that way? Does this mean I'm gay? And of course, the enemy will whisper, oh, yeah, I've been telling you all along. There's something deficient about your masculinity. Um, and likewise, for little girls, I, I had um, a disconnect with my own mom. Despite her best attempts to nurture me, I rejected her. I judged her. And I said, you know what? You're weak. You're emotional. I want to be like dad. I don't want that womanly stuff. And it left a vacuum in my heart for feminine same-sex love that didn't get met the way God designed. And that left me vulnerable to the advances of a junior high teacher who took advantage of me, a female teacher, and had an inappropriate relationship with her, further compounding my confusion about my own sexuality, which was already a mess. 
And so it, the enemy can use areas like this, developmental influences like this, to derail someone's sexuality. There's no formula because we're all different. Our personality temperaments respond differently to different things. My sister grew up in the exact same home. She has never struggled with her sexuality. She struggles in other ways. But I experienced certain things in the home and I interpreted it a certain way and my personality responded a certain way and it had an impact on my sexuality. So those are examples of three areas. There's an infinite amount of ways the enemy can try to derail our sexuality. But suffice it to say, developmental influences can play a role. So in as far as my research, those that's just kind of a, a synopsis of uh, when I looked at the science and developmental issues, uh, Dr. Gagnon already covered the theology today. Um, and then I moved into my practical research. I wanted to do field research on, on people that had experienced change because there are, there, there, there are studies out there that study is change possible. One of the most well-known ones, uh, Stanton Jones and Mark Yarhouse released a study in 2011 where they followed people. They did a, a what's called a longitudinal study. So a study over the length of six to seven years where they followed people who experienced same-sex attractions and were hopeful that maybe those attractions would change. And so they followed them over the course of that time. And what they discovered over those six to seven years as they were interviewing these individuals, that 23% of the people that they were following did experience what they call success. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the terms here, but they call it success conversion. Um, and I guess that goes in alignment with conversion therapy. I'm personally not a fan of the word successful conversion when I, I, I'm not a fan of heterosexual and homosexual. We made those terms up. They don't exist. I like to use biblical terms, disorder, deceitful desires and transformation rather than sexual orientation change because there isn't a sexual orientation doesn't exist. We made that up. Um, but at any rate, I'm using their language because I built my study on their study. So they talked about there being this successful conversion where 23% of their participants, which amounted to 14 people out of the 60 something that they had, um, they experienced a reduced, reduced homosexual attractions and conversion to heterosexual attraction and functioning. And so what they concluded in their study is that change is possible um, and it's not harmful. And that the line today is that, oh, if you try to help somebody in this area of sexuality to experience a change in those desires, not only can it not happen, it is actually harmful if you try. Because it's the same way, you know, if, if it's inborn and it's in your DNA, you simply can't change that. Well, um, their research indicated people actually did change. And those who didn't experience the amount of change they were hoping to experience, they said, you know what, the process actually wasn't harmful. It, it, it wasn't detrimental, even though I didn't experience the amount of change I wanted to. So their conclusions, change is possible and the process itself is not harmful. You won't hear that touted on the news today. But unfortunately, their study doesn't explain why only 23% experienced quote unquote success or significant change, whereas the others didn't. And they surmise in their findings and their in their discussion of their study that, you know, there were 16 different ministries represented. They use their pool of findings came from out of the old Exodus International. They had participate. That's where they drew their pool of participants from. And um, they had 16 different ministries represented, a number of different methodologies represented. You had each individual varied as far as their motivation or maybe their support network. There were so many variables that they, they couldn't say why some may have experienced change and why others didn't. Interestingly enough, um, Jones and, and Mark Yarhouse of the pairing, Jones and Yarhouse, has now changed his tune. Rather than contending for transformation, uh, he came out with a, a new book recently called Costly Obedience, What We Can Learn from the Celibate Gay Christian Community. And he has essentially taken the position, you know what, change is not likely. And what we need to do is instead of contending for change, we need to support those who experience same-sex attractions and want to live according to a biblical sexual ethic and remain celibate, 
but they're not likely to change. So let's just support them in their same sex attractions. And they call themselves gay Christians. And at the surface, it sounds compassionate. Like let's help these people who are wanting to live according to God's design, not act on those desires, but this is a part of who they are. It's their lived experience. However, theologically speaking, to, to identify as gay is contrary to scripture. We're commanded to put off the old self, not to embrace it and label ourselves by it. And to the degree that I say, oh, I'm a gay Christian, what I'm essentially saying is this is, this dictates my identity, these desires, and it determines my destiny. And that's not true, scripturally speaking. We're to put off the old self, be made new in the attitude of our minds so that we can put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, according to Ephesians 4. So at any rate, he has uh, gone towards the, the way of uh, gay Christianity, celibate gay Christianity, and just no, no longer contending for transformation. And even regarding transgender ideology, his position is, you know, let's, let's intervene with the least invasive means possible. Um, he doesn't contend for transformation, but says, you know, if, if a man needs to wear a little some light makeup to kind of take the edge off of that dysphoria. Uh, we wouldn't recommend, you know, sex reassignment surgery as a first step, but let's intervene with the least invasive means possible. And there's no discussion of transformation and how transformation happens. So when I was looking at my research, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to go a different direction than your house went. He said, well, only 23% change, so change isn't likely, so let's just support everybody in their same-sex attractions. And I came from a different perspective, and I said, wait a minute. If your study indicates people can change, then why did some people change, only 23%, but others did not? Is there something we can learn from that 23% that did change? that might inform our pastoral care to those who are experiencing same-sex attractions and perhaps help facilitate transformation in their lives. So that was my study. So I, I built it on the research question, what factors do we find among those who do experience successful change or biblically speaking transformation in this area of their life. So I'm, I'm kind of starting backwards from their study where they say, hey, 23% change. All right, then let's hone in on that 23%. What's true of them that may not be true of the others? And so my design was case studies of 30 men and women. So 15 men, 15 women. And I essentially their study showed that 14 out of the, I think it was 61 or 64% a participant. And so they had 14 that had successful change. And I said, all right, let's double it. Let's do 30. Let's look at 15 men and 15 women and just really hone in on that and say, what's true of their lives? How did they experience transformation? And can this help us as we're ministering to others in this area? So I started with what's called snowball sampling. Um, I started with a, a few people who met the parameters of the study and then said, do you know anybody that might, you know, fit the parameters? And I just, by referrals, just kind of snowballed out from there. I didn't know what I was going to get. I didn't know people in the study. I had no clue. It was just kind of a toss up of what was going to happen. Um, but I started there and they had to fit specific parameters. And some people, when I asked them, hey, do you fit the parameters of the study? They said, oh, no, I don't. I'm, I'm disqualified. I can't participate. So the parameters were this. They had to have a experience, you know, fit the, the definition of the Jones and Yarhouse successful conversion, which was a resolution of homosexual attraction. And again, I'm using their language, even though I call it deceitful disorder desires, a resolution of homosexual attraction and substantial conversion to heterosexual attraction. Secondly, homosexual attraction is either missing or present only incidentally in a way that does not seem to bring about distress or undue temptation. Meaning these are people who are no longer mastered and dominated by same-sex attractions where it's dictating their identity, determining their destiny. They're, they're white knuckling it every day, trying not to act on it. That's, that's not who they are. They have been transformed and they don't experience, if they do experience temptation, it's just, it's an incidental thing, but it's not dominating their life. Um, third, they experience an enduring pattern of freedom. And I, I set the parameter like it's got to be a minimum of five years. It's, this isn't just like a flash in the pan. 
Um, but uh, a minimum of freedom of at least five years to show that this is an enduring pattern in their lives. And then describing it, um, I'm healed. I rarely experience homosexual desire to a significant proportions. And if married, enjoy a good sex life with my spouse. If single, they experience heterosexual attractions. So these are the parameters of the Jones and Yarhouse study. They set these. And so I said, I am going to start with your definition of successful conversion and work from there. So again, I did snowball sampling, didn't know what I was going to get and how it would turn out. As far as the demographics, um, I'm going to summarize the findings real fast here. Um, we can't go through all the findings. Um, as far as the age parameters, it was we had people in their 30s all the way into their 70s. And so we had a wide range of people, again, 15 men, 15 women. I was curious what their denominational backgrounds were, because, again, I was doing snowball sampling. I don't know these people, their backgrounds. So um, at the time of their salvation, um, these were the different backgrounds. So you can see it was a variety of backgrounds. I happen to I'm from the Assemblies of God. So um, I wasn't going after like, let's find all the Assemblies of God people that have experienced transformation. There happened to be three of them in the study. Uh, that at salvation they were participate in an assemblies of god church and for most people when they began to ex to go through the process of transformation that was around the time of salvation it wasn't true for all of them but for most and so i just thought it would be interesting to find out okay what what was their denominational affiliation so you can see we've got everything from assemblies of god baptist calvary chapel catholic church of god episcopalian independent christian methodist missionary alliance non-denominational presbyterian southern baptist and the vineyard um, so we got a variety there. And then I was asking them, okay, just tell me about your normal like habits as a believer. Like what, what kinds of believers are these? So as far as Bible reading, they were all reading the Bible regularly, whether or not every day or, or multiple times a week. So these are people who are entrenched in the word. And that came out in their narratives as I, I did um, interviews, individual interviews privately over Zoom and the interviews were anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. One was two hours because they were quite talkative. But um, I'm just listening. I'm just asking them questions. Tell me your story. And I'm listening for things and taking notes. And I had software that helped me find similarities between the stories. And so I, as I'm listening to these stories, I could hear, wow, these are people that are familiar with the word. They are renewing their mind regularly in the word of God. And I found that interesting. Um, I asked them, you know, tell me about your prayer life. They're all praying daily, if not several times a week. Um, I'm a Pentecostal, so I asked both about praying in English and then also praying in tongues. Interestingly, I wasn't, I didn't, this was a surprising finding. All of them in the study, 28 out of the 30 participants were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, which is that that's a, I know that's a denominational perspective from the Assemblies of God. I, not everybody on this call comes from that perspective, but I just found that interesting. And of the two who said, oh no, I never pray in tongues, they were open to the experience. One had said, I've actually heard tongues in my head. I've never spoken it out. And another said, I, I move in other gifts of the spirit. I've just never experienced, you know, speaking in other tongues. I, I just found that interesting that there weren't out of those 30 people, there was nobody that came from what we call a cessationist perspective where they say the gifts of the Spirit are not active today. All of them had an openness to the gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then as far as their change in their attractions, I asked them, um, tell me about your life growing up as a child. And this is a weakness of the study because we're relying on their memory and their perception. And so their perception and their memory could serve them wrong. But if you asked me, Linda, what were your attractions like growing up? Were you exclusively attracted to the same sex? Did you have some attractions to the opposite sex? I mean, I can tell you right off the bat, I never experienced an attraction to a man. And that's not hard for me to remember. It's my lived experience. So I asked them that question and I asked them to rate on what's called the Kinsey scale. Where were your attractions? And so this is how it came out. Um, five of them said exclusively attracted to the same sex, never experienced an attraction to the opposite sex. 11 of them said, hey, I'm predominantly attracted to the same sex. Sometimes I experience an opposite sex attraction. Four of them said predominantly same sex, but more than incidentally, heterosexually attracted. 
Um, some would consider themselves what the world calls bisexual. I'm attracted to the same sex, but I'm also attracted to the opposite sex. And then five, six of them said, I'm predominantly attracted to the same sex, but you know what? It's more than incidentally, homosexual thoughts are coming in and I'm, I'm struggling with that. And so this was their experience as a child. And then I asked them to re, re, uh, relate, okay, where are you today? As I'm interviewing you today, where do you fall on that scale? Okay, so look at this graphic, just look at the big picture and you can visually see the change of where they are today. And it's just drastic. They, they it, a very significant change, no matter where they fell on that spectrum, they all moved closer to exclusive uh, attractions to the opposite sex. And interestingly, 14 out of the 16 are like, hey, I don't even experience temptation today. This has been so renewed in my mind with new neural pathways and acting out um, and following God's word that it's just not a struggle for me anymore. 16 of them said, on occasion, I experience temptation, but it's not something that dominates my life anymore like it used to. Um, likewise, I went through um, how many years have you been free now of same-sex attraction? Um, the average mean of enduring change was 18.7 years among all the participants. So they, they had to be free a minimum of five years. Um, but you can see in this graphic, it's an enduring pattern of change that averaged out to be 18 years among them. Um, as far as developmental influences, 87%, all uh, 87 of the participants experienced gender nonconformity. 80% had adverse family dynamics of a variety and 60% had experienced childhood sexual abuse. And that doesn't include two of the women that had been sexually assaulted as adults. I didn't include that. I only included childhood stuff. Now I asked them to rate, okay, as a child, where did you see yourself as far as gender nonconformity? Were you secure in your gender identity, in your manhood, in your womanhood? Were you insecure? Were you somewhere in between? So I created kind of a Kinsey scale for gender identity. And this is how they rated themselves. Nobody completely rejected it because that would be transgender. But, you know, they ranged anywhere from completely uncomfortable to slightly uncomfortable, somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, only one said, you know, I was just confident in who I was as a man or a woman, but I still experienced same-sex attraction. So there was some degree of gender insecurity there. But when I asked them at present day, after you've gone through transformation, where are you at? And boom, you can see the difference there. Were they all... Uh, maintain either moderately or confident uh, security in their gender identity, um, which I found interesting that you can see a very significant change there between those two graphs. And then I asked them about their relationship with their same-sex parent. Did you experience emotional closeness to the same-sex parent? Because sometimes that can play into same-sex attraction. And you could see 22 of them said, you know what, I wasn't close to my same-sex parent at all. But now where would you rate yourself today? And there's, you can definitely see an increase. Now, some, you know, the parents have died and, you know, there's uh, various factors and things involved. Um, but it was interesting to hear their stories and how some had actually ha maintained a better relationship with the same sex parent, or they had been through some healing prayer and it changed their perception by releasing forgiveness towards their parents. And they just didn't feel as much of a um, a, a, a barrier between them and that parent. And then I asked about methodology as far as, okay, what, what was a part of the transformation process for you? And th this is really small on my screen. I don't know if it's small on yours, but, um, the, I was investigating like what was most helpful to you. And the most helpful one for people was inner healing prayer. Um, on an individual one-on-one, -on -one, somebody meeting with you and they were experiencing uh, what some call emotional healing in the context of prayer where the Lord might bring up a painful memory and the prayer counselor would, would help them walk through that memory and they would actually experience the Lord in the context of that. I'll give you one example. One lady was, you know, living, uh, living as a lesbian, sex with another woman, knew she wasn't following God. And she was actually at church and hadn't been there in a while. And um, she was visiting for somebody else. And she just closed her eyes and she was worshiping. And all of a sudden she had a vision. And in this vision, she saw herself in a prison cell. And it was a white prison cell, white walls, but all over the walls were excrement. And it was her own excrement. And she saw Jesus as the door was open. She saw Jesus at the door and he was beckoning her to come in. And she was like, or he was beckoning her to come out. And she, she was like, uh-uh. And so Jesus said, well, then can I come in? 
And so he came into this prison wall full of her mess and sat with her. And it was like this healing moment of seeing God as he really is, because she thought God was mad at her and hated her and experiencing his presence in the context of this vision. And it facilitated some, some deep healing in her heart, which was um, six months later, she was stepping out of where she was at because of the healing that had happened between her and the Lord. So that's an example. Um, so inner healing prayer was really uh, the most predominant. Um, second one was individual counseling. Um, and, then, and the third one was uh, deliverance, dealing with demonic entities that were connected to inner healing. Um, so mindsets, you now overall, the mindsets that contributed to change. Number one, pursuing intimacy with Jesus, not changing whether they're attracted to the same sex or not. They, were, they would say things like, my, my goal was never to be straight. It was to become whole or that, that change isn't like a process. It's a person. It's knowing Jesus. Change came as a byproduct of intimacy with Jesus, not because they were seeking change for the sake of change. Um, they surrendered to Jesus lordship in all areas of life. They got everything out in the out, out of the dark and into the light, as we were talking with Mark and Christie's testimony. There's power. It breaks the power of the enemy to keep you in bondage when you bring it in light. Finding their identity in Christ instead of their attractions. None of them identified, and it wasn't trendy. For some of them were old enough that it wasn't trendy to identify as a gay Christian. Um, but none of them adopted that identity. They identified as a child of God first who may have struggled with disordered desires, but it didn't dictate their identity. They all had a belief that change remains possible, and it's a normative part of the Christian life of what the Bible calls progressive sanctification, that we can change in this area just as much as we can change in on any other area. They understood change doesn't mean cure, doesn't mean voila, everything just goes away in an instant, but we can experience degrees of change where a decrease in frequency and intensity of those desires. They were willing to face the pain from pat the past hurts in the presence of Jesus. This was one of the things that blew me away because I'm interviewing these people individually and they all kept repeating the same three words, face the pain, face the pain. And after, you know, about 10 people, I was like, are they talking to each other? Why are they all saying the same? And I just felt like I was swimming in the sea of revelation. And the Lord was showing me how important it is to face the pain from our past that may be contributing to our present reality. Um, they Finding resolution to shame and rejection, huge uh, in, in their view of God and security and who they are as a person. Reframing temptation as disordered desires that are seeking illegitimate fulfillment. So when they understood, one guy said he was he felt a, a wave of um, attraction. He's five foot eight, and he saw a guy that was running, had his shirt off, and uh, he was like, "Oh man!" And he he just felt this attraction to him, and he's like, "Wow, oh, no, what's going on?" And the Lord was like, "Think about it. That guy's six foot four. He's ripped. You're five foot eight with a pot belly." you're not sexually attracted to him. You just want to be him. You would like to have his body. And he's like, yep, that's right. I would like to have a body like that. And he started to realize his attractions, though his brain had been trained neurologically to go to the sex as a route, really what was underneath that, the root to the fruit was insecurity and in who he was as a man. And that insecurity had become sexualized. Um, another one, allowing for uniqueness in each person's journey. Everybody's journey was different. There is no formula. Follow these 12 steps and you'll be free. I wish it were that easy. Um, and then an openness, again, to the supernatural, to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to inner healing, to deliverance. And finally, an openness to continued growth and healing. That it wasn't like, oh, I'm done. I've checked that box off. All of them had this idea that God can still work in my life, whether it's in the area of my sexuality or like Christy was saying, that the temptations raised its ugly head after like 10 years. And she verbalized that to her husband, Mark. It broke the power of that, of the enemy to try to pull her back into her past. But just remaining open to what God, what, what might the Lord be doing here? And how does he want to continue to bring growth and healing in my life? Now, I did ask the participants, all right, you've experienced significant change. But what about those who don't? What have you seen? What do you think happens in those that don't experience the degree of change that you've experienced? And here's what they said. These are people that focus on change rather than intimacy with Jesus. They are fixated 
on whether those desires change or not. And they'll put a timeline on it and be like, you know what? I've tried this for two, three years. It hasn't changed. I'm a gay Christian now. I'm giving up. Um, so they fixate on the, the desires changing rather than fixing our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. Secondly, not submitting secret sin to Christ's lordship. Many of them, um, they would watch their friends and say, you know what? They wouldn't get everything out into the light. They kept stuff in the dark. And especially one of the predominant ones was uh, porn addiction, gay porn addiction. And if you don't bring that in the light and deal with it, then that's going to continue to be something that you self-medicate with. And if you self-medicate, then the Holy Spirit, it's like you're tying the Holy Spirit's hands. How is he going to intervene in your life if you're like, nope, I'm going to take care of this myself and self-medicate? Embracing a gay identity. And again, as soon as you embrace that, it's as if you're saying, I will go this far and no further. It dictates my identity and determines my destiny. Refusing to face the pain and self-medicating through maladaptive coping mechanisms like pornography, self-gratification, emotional dependency, very common, staying caught in those relationships. And it's just a cover-up where you're not facing the pain. And then a refusal to persevere in the lifelong process of change. Not getting discouraged if you experience a temptation and going, okay, what's going on here? Temptation doesn't mean you haven't changed. Temptation can be what I discovered among my participants is one of three things. Sometimes it's just the enemy trying to pull us back into our old life. And are we going to take the bait or not? And sometimes we just need to stand and say, that's not who I am anymore. And it lifts and it goes and not give into it and go, why am I struggling with this and get all introspective and discouraged? Sometimes we found that it was a familiar, a spirit that was familiar to them that was operating on someone else and they were actually operating in discerning of spirits and they didn't realize they were feeling a wave of lust, but it wasn't coming internally from them. It was actually coming from someone else they were talking to and that person was lusting after them, but they were interpreting the discerning of spirits as this must be my own lust when really God was telling them this person is experiencing this and you need to pray for them. And then the third one was sometimes God uses temptation as a breadcrumb trail to lead us back to a root that hasn't been resolved yet. And that root, the, 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 the temptation is the fruit to a deeper root. So if you remain open to continued growth and healing and transformation and say, Lord, is there something else here that you're wanting to resolve? You can actually grow further from that. Temptation can actually be a blessing and catapult you into further transformation. So don't get discouraged by it. And then finally, a lack of Holy Spirit power to affect change. If you, if you don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and again, a, a lot of them, well, the majority experience inner healing and deliverance and the role of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding those that were facilitating prayer. And I know Living Waters and a lot of the other people on the, the uh, call today, um, that's, that's been their experience, is allowing the Holy Spirit to show us where are those roots to the fruit that we're experiencing so that the Lord can bring resolve in those areas. So if to summarize everything, um, the Lord showed me a basically a cycle of transformation that I saw in these participants. And when I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this was true in my own life and my own transformation as well. And so what I saw was uh, initially, if they recognize the temptations themselves are not their identity. This is not, I'm, I'm born this way and can't change. This is not, I'm a gay Christian and I'll have to white knuckle it the rest of my life and just be a celibate gay Christian and try not to act on it. But instead recognizing, okay, these are disordered desires. God, I'm not created in the image of God to be attracted to the same sex. As Dr. Gagnon was talking about, we are, we are created for a sexual other, for women to be attracted to men and vice versa. And if I'm not attracted to the one that God designed me to be attracted to, then something is off in the soul. It's a disordered desire in the mind, emotions, and will, and it's affecting my psychosexual development. So rather than a, a embracing the old self and adopting it as my identity, I say, wait a minute, that's not who I am in God. How can I renew my mind? Okay, this is a disordered desire. The desire is real. I feel like acting on it, but I'm going to submit this to the Lord for what it is. It's a disordered desire. And I'm going to submit to the lordship of Christ in the context of community. Not a single one of them got healed in isolation. So in the context of submitting to good and godly community and experiencing redemptive relationships where they're accepted as a man among men or a woman among women, despite 
their gender nonconformity and their love for who they are, where they're at. That in and of itself was healing. And then bringing those desires, the, the, the deceitful desires and all of that into the light in the context of community. It breaks the shame, it breaks the rejection, and it brings them in a place where th this is a, a safe place for you to, to confess your sins one to another, pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then cultivate intimacy with Jesus. Don't fixate on the desires changing. Get your eyes set on Jesus. Have the same attitude as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm not bowing down to that idol. You can throw me into the furnace. God's going to deliver me. And even if he doesn't, I'm not bowing down to the idol of born that way can't change. I'm not going to adopt an identity of being a celibate gay Christian. I am going to contend for transformation and God's going to transform me. But my eyes are on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, not on how much change is taking place. Change will happen as a byproduct as I fix my eyes on the Lord. And then as you're cultivating that intimacy, what's going to happen is the Lord will begin to put his finger on different areas of our lives where that bad fruit, it, he's, it's like a breadcrumb trail leading us to the root behind that. And that leads to inner healing, facing the pain in the presence of Jesus, oftentimes with a trusted prayer facilitator to help us face that pain and experience healing of the soul, healing in the mind, healing even deliverance where there are demonic entities. If you let the sun go down on your anger, you give the devil a foothold. So we got to release bitterness and unforgiveness and our sinful reactions to painful experiences in our lives. We have to repent for those wrong responses and that sin in our heart. It's not the wound of rejection per se uh, that is the greatest problem. It's my sinful reaction to that wound where I don't forgive the person and I make an inner vow. I will never or you know things like that. So facing the pain in the context of inner healing and deliverance but it's not a one and done kind of thing. This is a transformation cycle where you remain open to continued growth and healing over time. And so as they remained open to that, it was like layers of an onion. The Lord might, you know, over the course of a year, reveal one of those layers and deal with it. And then like for six months, nothing else is happening because he knows what you're ready for. I wanted it to be a Ginzu knife in my own life, cut through all the layers at once and be done with it. But that's not how progressive sanctification and discipleship works. It's a lifelong process of yielding to the Lord. And so as they remain open to continued growth and healing, then the cycle starts over again where they recognize, huh, okay, there's some more disordered desires that are coming up. And they're not always sexual. Sometimes it has to do with envy. Sometimes it's bitterness and unforgiveness. Sometimes it's whatever it might be. But as you remain open to that, recognize those desires and go through the process again. I, personally, I lost track of how many times I went through this cycle myself. So we're gonna end there. I meant to go over on the side so you could complete your thought, okay. not right onto the screen, <laughs> sorry about that. Hey, so, um, so important. Everything you shared was just so powerful. Thank you so much, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, I can't wait for your book. Um, I'm looking forward to reading every word of it. and. Um, what you have to share is so empowering and enlightening and a whole bunch of comments over on the left that were on the right that were sharing. Uh, everything you say applies to heterosexual struggle. Um, excellent presentation. Thank you for this information. So, so reinforcing of transformed lives. Uh, people that I know who are, have walked through this uh, process also who were not part of the study, I'm sure. Not that I know, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know exactly who you had in your study, uh, yeah. but uh, face the pain was a huge one. Um, mm -hmm. Many people resonated with that. So just an FYI, mm -hmm. um, there are a bunch more messages down below. I'm going to go check the chat and then let's go into the question and answer um, area. Just want to make sure if any questions are over there that they get into the right area. Um, just a lot of great comments about, wow, that was powerful. Um, you guys rock. Thank you so much. And Linda, you rock, girl. <laughs> I'm just so, so thrilled that you've done the research you have. I'm glad to know you. I'm glad you're my friend. I'm glad that you are faithfully walking with Jesus and um, have produced some materials that were so desperately needed. Um, 
I could say so much more. So let's just stop the, all that for the moment and, and ask the questions. I think um, somebody asked a question about disorder desire, wondering if you could define that. Um, mm -hmm. The person said, I think, can you define disorder desire? I think you know what you, I know what you mean, but it would appreciate if you, your perspective more, if you could help me out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in God's design, he created us male and female. And we see in Genesis 1, as Dr. Gagnon was talking the, earlier today, uh, about his design for our sexuality is, you know, Adam, originally the human, Adam, was the first splitting of the first Adam. Um, and you have Adam and Eve, and then the two becoming one, Genesis 2.24. Um, and the idea of male and female coming, the, the sexual complements being one, that's God's design for sexuality. And they can fulfill the procreation mandate to be fruitful, be multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. A same-sex union cannot fulfill that mandate. It's not God's design for sexuality. And ultimately, our sexuality images the, the marriage between Christ and his bride, the church, and the gospel itself. So by disordered desires, I mean it's not in order with the creation order of who we're created to be as male and female. Uh, another way I refer to it is deceitful desires, because Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 actually says that. Put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. So that's what I meant by that. And I think some people, and the reason why I think they might have asked that question is you could come at it from a perspective of therapy, and maybe it should be defined as a disordered desire in the mm -hmm. um, American Psych Psychiatric Association manual. Therefore, it becomes something you can you know, get paid for as a counselor. So there's that perspective. We're not really addressing that. Right. I don't think that's what you were talking about when you were discussing this. Um, there's also a Catholic view where they talk about disordered desires. That's a lot more aligned with the therapeutic and counseling division as well. So Linda's talking about the scriptural view and God-oriented view of how our sexuality was meant to function and when it's off out of that function. Is that about right, Linda? Yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so the next question is, are uh, we are seeing more, are we seeing more people on the spectrum, assuming that means autistic spectrum, who face gender dysphoria? Now this isn't quite on the topic of this um, talk, but I think you're the right person to ask. Sure. So I think I forgot this in the breakout. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, then you have a chance now. That's Which great. Asking. So yeah, what we do see is those who have autism, they don't do well with abstraction and they're very, you know, stuck on the concrete and they can get fixated. And in our LGBTQ affirming culture today, you tell an autistic child, hey, you're the opposite sex and they get fixated on that. And they're just not able to process beyond that. Um, so yes, we do see in our culture today, a lot of the girls that are falling into ROGD, they are somewhere on the autism spectrum. And it also ties into social awkwardness. This is going to relieve your social awkwardness and all of that. And actually, there are influencers on social media platforms, like trans influencers. They say, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you feel awkward around others, well, that must mean you're actually a woman in a man's body or a, a man in a woman's body. And right. so what will fix your problem is... If you simply um, take the cross-sex hormones and if you um, adopt a cross-sex identity and begin pursuing that and then force everybody else to applaud you in it. So what happens when a girl starts taking testosterone? Are you aware? Because I've heard a bit about that. Um, yeah, testosterone is a natural euphoric drug. So when a female begins taking it, it all of a sudden makes it feel like her anxiety and depression goes away. She experiences courage and boldness in conversation. It changes her personality. And it's almost like a false being born again. Like it's a, it's a new, she's a new person. It doesn't last. Except for um, facial hair grows and yeah. voice changes if it's taken at the right time. And I, and all sorts of other effects, right, happen to somebody. Yeah, permanent permanent changes to the body. Yeah, that, wow. yeah. yeah, we know people, Linda and I both know people who've been through some degree of those changes. And, you know, once you make some chemical changes to your body um, or surgical changes for sure, um, there is a permanence to this. There's always been the 
Uh, oh, good. People are asking more questions. But meanwhile, I'm going to ask her one more since I've got her right here. But um, so there is there was a quote that was often used in the UK and is now commonly used in the US, which is um, if somebody blocks or does a puberty blockade. Now, you're not a medical doctor, so I want to put that there. And we are going to have somebody talk about these things from a medical perspective tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody does a blockade of puberty, they go past the ages of puberty, um, the, the changes are permanent, aren't they? Yeah, puberty is not a disease. And if you halt the natural process of puberty in your body, there are key things that happen during puberty regarding bone density and just the, the natural development of the brain. And if yes. you halt that, it has, you, you can't get those developmental years back. And right. so not only will it stop some key parts of your development as far as strengthening your body to grow into who God created you to be physically, um, it can also impact your uh, reproduct reproductivity and, and make you sterile. Yes. And so those things are permanent changes and yeah. lifelong. They're a mm -hmm. future, um, future reality. And mm -hmm. we'll talk more about that tomorrow, though. So let's move on to some more of the questions. When walking with someone who is struggling with same-sex attraction, how do we best encourage them to not focus on change, but all uh, while acknowledging that change is a distinct possibility when following Jesus? How do we help them get to that place of not being obsessed about change, but rather turning their eyes upon Jesus? Yeah, amen. I think when you realize that the attractions themselves, if you if you believe the narrative born gay can't change, or like the, these desires are so resistant to change, it's going to be impossible. And you fixate on the desires, but you don't go, wait a minute. If there's a reason, there's a resolution. And so the you can trust the Lord that he's going to unpack and put his finger on all the areas of my life that may seemingly have nothing to do with sexuality. Bitterness and unforgiveness in my heart, not a porn addiction. And, you know, relational brokenness and rejection and shame and all of that. And as I just yield to the Lord and say, I'm an open book, I get everything that's in the dark into the light, whether it seems sexual or not, you will discover change happens as a byproduct of surrender and yielding to the Lord. And of course, you don't like ignore the fact, are things changing or not? I mean, I, I was aware things weren't changing as quickly as I wanted them to. <laughs> or I'd have growth I get and think yeah. I was more changed than I was and then realize, uh oh, nope, I'm still struggling. So, you know, there's the up and down with that. But if you fixate on only change and only the desires, you will get discouraged because it will never go as fast as you want it to go. Gotcha. Thank you very much for that. I believe I've heard that there may be a connection or correlation between autism and attachment theory issues. Have you heard anything to confirm this type of study? since attachment issues are pretty common for same-sex attraction and LGBT persons. Now, just a real quick note, tomorrow, um, um, Melissa Ingram is going to handle attachment theory and sexuality. So this might be a more appropriate topic there. But is there anything about that question you would like to answer, Linda? Or we'll move on to the next. I am aware attachment of theory is huge. And uh, the bond that we have, especially with the same sex parent, but um, I'm not an expert in that area. I don't think I can. I think Melissa would give a better answer than I can. OK, fantastic, because we have more questions. Um, does this does it make a difference if people view the desires themselves as sin? I would look forward to your answer on that. And <laughs> I'm not going to answer it. <laughs> yeah, so when we look at body, soul, spirit, and at the root of my attractions, in my case, I rejected my own mom and it left that vacuum for feminine love. It is not a sin for me to long for that legitimate desire to be filled in a legitimate way. But because I missed that part in my developmental process, then that legitimate desire got confused with my normal sexual drives and desires in my teenage years and it became sexualized. So is that attraction to women, is it a sin for me to be attracted? Well, it's a, it's a sin for me to act out on that, to meditate on it, to allow that to conceive in my mind and lust and all of that. Absolutely. But is the legitimate desire for feminine love a sin? Well, God designed me to have maternal nurture. 
And so I think we have to be careful that we don't condemn people for, for experiencing same-sex attractions and like, rah, you know, we just, we throw the baby out with the bathwater in a sense. And then we're not going to be curious as to why that desire is because the Lord can show us what might be at the root of that and how the Lord wants to minister to a legitimate desire and meeting that legitimate desire in legitimate ways. So for me, God used redemptive relationships with whole feminine women in the body of Christ that love me as a woman among women and men who affirm me as a woman distinct from yet cherished by men. Um, and he also used deep inner healing where I was just so at odds with who God created me to be. And I needed him to heal that in me. And it, it wasn't a sin for me to like the desire to be a man or the desire to connect sexually with women was coming out of a legit desire that I was trying to fulfill in an illegitimate way. So it's what Romans chapter one says, I was looking to created things rather than my creator. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd like to just reaffirm what Linda's saying, but the fact is you need to parse the things because same sex attraction is usually combined with or mixed in with other legitimate desires. And so again, what she's saying is yes, part of it is sin nature, but it's also a, a mangling of some things that are very good that you need to pull apart and say, okay, let's look at this good need and how do we fulfill that appropriately? So um, thank you very much, Linda, that you said that brilliantly. How do, do you see, um, do you see an age where transformation was not possible or does the brain remain plastic as long as you live? Plasticity. I happen to know a little bit about this too. So yeah, you go girl. One of the things that if you, there's a difference between the 15 year old that has these attractions and has never acted on them um, versus a 55 year old who has had over a thousand partners and has reinforced this. I mean, they have some significant neural pathways in their brain um, and significant, you know, acting out and there'll be a greater degree of withdrawal and life changes and, you know, just transformation that needs to happen, just practically mm -hmm. speaking in that 55 year old than a 15 year old. So there are reasons why some experience greater degrees of change than others, not to say change is impossible um, for anyone by any means, absolutely. Uh, everybody can be transformed, but we do have to look logistically at, you know, what is it that we're dealing with? And it does take time to renew the mind and to walk in, in new pathways. Thank you so much, Linda, for sharing with us. We could go on and on, but we must, we must yep. stop at some point. <laughs> so thanks again. We sure appreciate you and are so grateful for you, sister. And with you. Thanks, Anne.